pleasure to introduce Professor John McKinney, who's coming to us from Lausanne, Switzerland. He's a professor at, he's the third hire at a new university that's dedicated to global health and infection immunity, I suppose, I don't know. And John um, did his PhD work at the Rockefeller where he did basic yeast genetics and cell cycle research. He then, as I tell my students, what we're all looking for is some passion, and John became passionate about tuberculosis. I don't know exactly how that happened, but he was, and decided to dedicate the rest of his career to working on TB. He went to Bill Jacobs' lab first at Albert Einstein, did a postdoc, went back to the Rockefeller, put together a big group of investigators, um, and for reasons that he can probably discuss with you elsewhere, he decided to leave Rockefeller and go to this great opportunity. Um, now, one thing about John, I've seen him speak over the years and read his paper, well, I actually haven't read your papers, but <laughs> I hear they're good. Um, but one thing, <laughs> nah, no one's read them, but no. The, um, that wasn't my point. Uh, the point was that you know, sometimes you go to a concert and it's really the, when you see someone live, it's that much better than the album. And sometimes when you uh, hear someone, and so when you hear John, it's really special. He's a deep thinker and he'll put things in, allow you to see things that you hadn't seen before. And it's always a joy to hear you speak. So, welcome. Thanks, Dan, very much. Well, that was the, the highlight of the talk as far as I'm concerned, and it's all downhill from here. Tom, you didn't warn me. You said that uh, Jeff Cox was going to introduce me, not Dangerous Dan. So, <laughs> thanks very much for that introduction, Dan, I, I, I think. Okay, so um, I want to preface the talk with a, uh, an apology, not an apology, with a, a disclaimer, okay? Uh, when Tom contacted me and said, uh, invited me to come and give a talk at this symposium, I said, that sounds really interesting. I'd love to do it. But you have to understand that when we, we moved the lab to uh, Swiss Tech, as we like to call it, uh, from Rockefeller a couple of years ago, we basically threw out everything that we had been doing previously and started from scratch. So I said, if you're okay with my talking about work that's very preliminary and that's very tech-oriented, um, then I'd be happy to give a talk. Uh, but I understand if, if that's not okay with you. He said, oh, no, people will love that. It's no problem. So uh, if, you, if you like the talk that I'm going to show, and I'll leave it up to you to to decide whether or not this is a cutting edge or hopelessly preliminary results. Um, if you like it, great. If you don't, uh, Tom's to blame, okay? So uh, we're all here for the same reason uh, today, and that is that we all recognize that uh, infectious diseases continue to be a really important cause of global morbidity and mortality. The, um, the title of my talk today reflects an interest we have in antibiotics, which I should have mentioned. Antibiotics continue to be an interesting subject because infectious diseases continue to be important. So according to the World Health Organization, of the 60 million or so people who die every year of all causes combined around the globe, something like a quarter to a third of them die of an infection, including the big three, HIV, AIDS, TB, and malaria, which together account for something like six to seven million deaths every year. So it's a, it's a big, big toll on human health and survival. Um, so this is a little bit of a paradox in a way, if you think about it, because Many of these infections are, are treatable with antibiotics, and TB, of course, is no exception. It is a treatable disease. These are the drugs that we currently use as the frontline drugs for treatment of tuberculosis. Of course, I have to point out that the most modern drug in the, in the current frontline for treating TB is about is more than 40 years old, right? So um, the further development of the TB armamentarium had, had faltered pretty badly for a number of decades, but there's a lot of exciting activity in this area currently. Um, the problem with treatment of tuberculosis, as uh, we, we've heard already mentioned briefly, is not that the drugs can't work. In fact, a patient who starts out with drug-sensitive TB and who assiduously takes a full course of antibiotics has about a 95% chance or so of being permanently cured of, of TB without relapse. The problem is that these drugs have to be administered for a minimum of six months to effect a cure to prevent relapse. And as you can appreciate, if you've ever had to take even a week or two of antibiotics, it's extremely difficult to keep on taking the drugs week after week, particularly if, as we've heard, you're talking about patients who live in very under-resourced uh, societies, okay? So if we could dramatically shorten the time for treatment of TB from six months to, let's say, a couple of weeks, more like uh, most infections, this could potentially have a huge impact on treatment of tuberculosis worldwide. So the, the focus of the talk today is going to be uh, on our efforts to understand 
why the drugs that we use to treat tuberculosis don't work better than they do with the hope that this will help us to develop new and better drugs in future that will circumvent the limitations of current drugs. So what I'm going to be talking about is the unusual ability of TB to persist for a very long time in the face of multidrug chemotherapy. And I want to make it clear from the outset that I'm not talking about drug resistance, right, which is a very well-studied phenomenon that is due to heritable mutations, you know, genetic mutations in the chromosome of the organism. What I'm going to be talking about is a persistence phenotype that is not due to underlying genetic mutations and which is not heritable, it's metastable, and the phenotype is readily, readily lost uh, in the absence of selection by antibiotics. So here in the schematic form is the problem that I'm talking about. If you were to look down the microscope, and we're going to be doing a lot of that today, at a population of bacteria that were then exposed to an antibiotic, what you would find is that in, in the early stages of exposure, most of the bacteria are readily killed, and uh, in, in some cases, at least, those bacteria lice. But there's always a small, stubborn subpopulation of cells that refuses to die no matter how long you expose them to the antibiotic. We call these persisters as opposed to resistors, because if you were to take that organism, regrow it, and subject that uh, clonal population to the same drug treatment again, you'd get exactly the same profile back again. So these are not heritably resistant mutants. So this, is, uh, this results in what we think of as a biphasic killing profile for anti-TB drugs. In, uh, in this case, it's in the lungs of a mouse, where I've plotted uh, log CFU, colony-forming units, on the y-axis versus days of therapy with the anti-TB drug isoniazid, or INH, which I'll be talking about a lot today. And what you can see is that in the early stages of therapy, there's an exponential decay of the bacterial population in the lungs. But starting after about four weeks of therapy, there's a deflection in the curve, if you like, which is clearly biphasic, and the population no longer decays at the same rate. And in fact, it decays very, very slowly. This is one of the reasons why we always use multiple drugs to treat TB. Besides the problem of heritable resistance mutations, it's essentially impossible to completely clear an infected animal or an infected person with a single anti-TB drug. You need combinations of drugs to achieve that. Now, as I said, the, this is a profile of bacteria in the lungs of an experimentally infected mouse, but it's important to understand that this biphasic shape of the kill curve is not dependent on the environment, okay? So it's true you see the same biphasic killing in the, in the sputum of patients who are subjected to monotherapy with anti-TB drugs, but you see, and I'll show you examples of that, exactly the same biphasic kill curve, even uh, on, in the simplest scenario imaginable where you have a clonal population of bacteria that are living in a, in a shaker culture in vitro, okay? So it is not an environmentally dependent uh, manifestation. So we're very interested in understanding what's different about these persister cells such that they survive prolonged exposure to an anti-TB drug that readily kills their genetically identical sisters even when they're living in the same environment. When you try to tackle a problem with this, you run up immediately against a problem that I've come to call the batch culture problem from which, when you stop and think about it, almost all of the assays that we use in biology today suffer. Here's the problem. Imagine you have a, a clonal population of bacteria growing in a homogeneous environment. You take an aliquot, as we commonly do in experiments, you take an aliquot of bacteria out of the flask and you grind up the cells and you measure, say, the activity of your favorite enzyme or your favorite messenger RNA levels and, and so on and so on. What this gives you is a population average value, bracketed P, stands for the average value. Um, and most assays achieve only that, population average values. The problem is that this population average value doesn't tell you anything at all about the underlying population structure with respect to whatever phenotype it is that you measured. So I'm showing that very schematically here. Um, usually when we make these population average measurements, we make the assumption that the parameter we're measuring, which again could be cell growth rate, it could be, or it could be the uh, expression of a particular enzyme, any, any quantifiable parameter you like. We make the assumption that, that the population distribution shown in this histogram around that average, uh, that, that population mean follows a more or less Gaussian distribution with a, a narrow distribution, okay? Um, but there's no reason it has to be like that. If we don't actually measure it, we don't know. It could be a very broad Gaussian distribution where the subpopulations of bacteria at either tail of the curve are very phenotypically different. Um, fancier distributions are not at all uncommon in uh, biology. For example, bimodal distributions, where the cells essentially 
partition into two discrete populations at one or another extreme of expression of this phenotype. In a situation like this, I would just like to point out that the average uh, population value doesn't mean anything because it doesn't actually represent any individual cell in that population. So not only is that population average measurement uh, pretty meaningless, it, it can be very, very misleading. And of course, we can have more exotic distributions like this one where the bulk of the population is in fact tightly clustered around the mean value, but the subpopulation you're interested in, for example, the persisters, is out here and is not actually contributing anything to that population averaged uh, value. So um, when we take these population averaged measurements, what we assume uh, the bacterial population looks like is something like this, where if we were to look down the microscope at the level of individual cells, whatever parameter it is that we're measuring is more or less evenly distributed between cells. So all the cells more or less look alike. Um, but what I'm going to tell you today and show you a few examples of that is that this is not at all how actual uh, bacterial populations look, even when they're clonal, even when they're living in homogeneous environments. There's enormous cell-to-cell -cell variation uh, with respect to any measurable phenotype you care to look at. Okay, so um, that includes, for example, the growth rate of individual cells. I won't go into this today, but for example, if you look at MTB uh, growing uh, exponentially under favorable growth conditions, the population has an average doubling time of 24 hours, but there are many individuals within that population that are doubling with a doubling time of more like five or six hours. There are other individuals that are doubling with a doubling time of more like two weeks. So that 24-hour measurement really doesn't tell you a lot about the behavior of the individuals in the population. Uh, the continuity of growth is extremely variable in, in our experience. So some cells grow very smoothly over the period of observation. Some grow and stop, grow and stop, grow and stop in a very saltatory manner. Again, population average measurements don't capture this. Um, the time between cell divisions is extremely variable as well. The symmetry of division is extremely variable. So at division, uh, the two daughter cells can be very unequal in size, and that has all kinds of consequences for the, the, the phenotype of, of the cells uh, downstream. Gene expression, and I'll show some examples of that, is extremely variable between individual cells in a population. Localization of proteins uh, within cells can, can be quite variable. The response to stresses can be extremely variable. I'll show this specifically in the context of the response to antibiotics, and so on and so on. So um, what we need to confront this extreme individuality of bacterial behavior, I, I would put to you, is uh, new tools to do single cell biology that will, I hope, eventually supplant or at least complement the assays that we currently use that measure only population average values. So from these tools, we want a number of different criteria. They need to give us quantitative data. There are a lot of assays, of course, that do that, but they don't give it to us at single cell resolution, relatively small number of um, assays that do that. A great example is the patch clamp technique, not only single cell, but single molecule resolution. The problem is it's very tedious, so you can't carry it out on large numbers of cells, which you need to detect rare behaviors and to get statistically meaningful results. Um, temporal tracking of cells is important so that we can follow the behavior of individuals over time. So for example, does a cell that starts out white over time become red and vice versa? Is there phenotypic mixing between these compartments of the population? You don't know unless you follow the cells over time. So for example, flow cytometry meets these first three criteria, but it does not provide this criterion. Now time-lapse microscopy gives you all four of these parameters, okay? But the one thing it doesn't traditionally allow you to do is to control the environment at will. So we have in fact adopted um, time-lapse microscopy as the major tool that we use experimentally in the lab, um, but we do this, uh, we do time-lapse microscopy in conjunction with microfluidic devices, and we use a variety of designs, I'll show you some of them today, in which we grow the bacteria. The microfluidic devices are essentially continuous flow chemostats that allow us to control the environment that the bacteria are seeing at will. So for example, we can grow them in the absence of the drug, monitor their behavior, add the drug, see how they respond, remove the drug, and see how they behave after removal of the drug. Now the, um, the uh, time-lapse microscopy that we carry out is with fully uh, computer-driven and automated and motorized uh, microscopy systems, which means that we can visit in a single experiment a, a large number of XY points, if you like. We can sample many, many re regions within the bacterial population and keep revisiting them over time again and again. So this allows us to collect at single cell resolution uh, quantitative information on the behavior of very large numbers of individual cells. Now this was the reason why I actually moved 
to EPFL, which is, a, uh, is an engineering school where, as Dan said, life sciences is just getting started within the last couple of years, was to uh, tap into the, the really fantastic um, resources that we have, particularly for microfabrication in the School of Engineering uh, in EPFL Center of Micro Nanotechnology. So all the, all the toys that I'll be showing you that we make are, are made in the facilities at the Center for Micro Nanotechnology. Now this is an example of one of the earliest devices that we designed and fabricated, a microfluidic device in which we can grow bacteria here, monitor their behavior by time-lapse microscopy, in which we are continuously feeding them through an input port here, and their wastes and the, the spent medium are carried away through an output port here. So again, it's a continuous flow device which allows us to grow the bacteria and add or take away um, things like antibiotics. So schematically, uh, this particular device, which we use a lot, looks something like this. The objective of the microscope is here. It's an inverted scope. Um, this on a large scale is a schematic of the device. If you focus on a little region here and blow it up, it's a, it's a very simple device consisting of a glass cover slip on which we place the bacteria. We then overlay that with a semi-permeable membrane and then put on top of that a block of a material called PDMS, which is a very nice transparent material um, that's very easy to fashion using techniques like uh, photolithography and soft lithography. So in this PDMS, we cut flow channels in this case, uh, 50 by 50 microns, and the bacteria are, uh, and then medium is fed through these flow channels, and the bacteria are then fed by diffusion of media across the membrane, and their wastes are carried away by diffusion in the opposite direction, and we can deliver drugs and other stressors to them in the same way. So using, uh, by growing the bacteria in this kind of device and then tracking them over time, we can get, starting from a single cell, a complete lineage of that cell through multiple cell divisions, but thanks to the microfluidics, we're also able, at will, to interpose a stress like an antibiotic, identify the rare persisters that survive prolonged exposure to the antibiotic, and we have a complete lineage of those cells' behavior so that we can track back and ask what, if anything, was different about these cells over time such that these individuals survived whereas their genetically um, identical siblings did not. So um, the first thing I have to tell you is that a lot of the work uh, that we've done in this area so far has been done with our workhorse, Mycobacterium smegmatis, which we use for tech development. Um, so a lot of the work I'm going to show you was done with this organism, but we've done very similar experiments with TB. I'll show you some of that, and the results are pretty comparable so far, with one important exception <clears throat> that I'll tell you about. So the first thing I have to tell you is that for both smeg and TB, if you grow the bacteria in the device, they grow very, very happily with the same average doubling time uh, as they do in, in batch culture, although there's huge individual variation in terms of the instantaneous growth rate. If you now add the drug isoniazid or INH, uh, growth ceases immediately. Remember that, it's important. I'll come back to that. The population uh, then largely dies off, and then there's this persister fraction that survives basically indefinitely. So we've treated uh, organisms for as much as eight weeks continuously, following them by time lapse microscopy, and you see very little further diminution in this plateau. Okay? So the, the point being that in microfluidic culture, as in batch culture, the, the kill curve is biphasic in shape. So this is an example of uh, an experiment like this, just to give you an idea of how we do it. In this particular experiment, this is with M. smegmatis. I'm going to grow the, the bacteria for one day in regular medium, which we call 7-H9, sorry for the jargon, it's just standard media, for one day to get their baseline behavior, recording all the time uh, their behavior. Yeah, if we can get the lights down a little bit, that might be helpful, it looks kind of dim to me. I'm then going to uh, treat them with isoniazid, INH, this frontline TB drug, for a week. Then I'm going to remove the drug and allow the, there's only going to be one survivor, I'll tell you, I'm going to allow that survivor, that persister, to regrow and form a microcolony over a period of two days. Then I'm going to reapply the drug for one day to show you that this was not a drug-resistant mutant and that when you reapply the drug, uh, you get exactly the same kill curve back that you got initially. So the bacteria have been transformed with GFP expressed from a strong constitutive promoter to make them easier to visualize. That's why they're green. So as long as uh, the film, as it's running, says 7-H9 up here, that means no drug. When it says INH, that means eyes and eyes at this front line, anti-TB drug has been added. There we go. Okay, so cells are growing and dividing. We now add the drug, and the first thing you see is that growth ceases. That's important, hang on to that idea. And the cells begin to lyse, not synchronously. Keep an eye on the cell up here because that's the one that, or rather one of its progeny, that's going to persist. Now after a time, these cells which froze very rapidly initially begin to resume growth. 
It's very slow compared to growth in the absence of the drug, but the point here is that persistence is a dynamic phenomenon. It's not a stationary phenomenon. So that's uh, the first dogma that has been debunked. And you can see that these are not resistant mutants already because one of the daughters of that division lysed, right, as did that one. This is the only one that's going to survive. We now return it to normal growth medium. That survivor grows out to form a microcolony. We now add back the drug. And as you can see, it's not a drug-resistant mutant. You get the same kill profile back again. Okay, so that's an example of persistence. Again, it's a metastable phenotype. It is not a heritable phenotype. So experiments like this allowed us really for the first time to directly address an hypothesis that was proposed um, some 60 years ago by Joseph Bigger, and which has become more or less a dogma. And in fact, it's, uh, this uh, idea has entered into the medical textbooks as the explanation for the persister phenomenon. So um, what uh, Bigger, who was the first one to identify the persister phenomenon, albeit in the, in the case of Staphylococcus and other bacteria and penicillin and drugs like that, so it's a generalizable phenomenon. It's not specific to TB. He hypothesized that these persisters might be insensitive to penicillin in this case because they were temporarily in a non-growing, non-dividing state, uh, which protected them from the action of penicillin because penicillin, as you know, targets the cell wall. So if you're not growing, you're not making cell wall, and so you're protected from the action of the drug. That's the hypothesis. So um, some 60-some years later, uh, this is very interesting in the context of TB because Isoniazid likewise targets a component of the mycobacterial cell wall, not peptidoglycan, but mycolic acids, these very long chain fatty acids that form a kind of outer membrane, if you like, on the surface of the bacteria. So it has been shown, and we've repeated those experiments, it's really true that when you add isoniazid to growing cells, mycolic acid synthesis shuts down very quickly. So the underlying idea in both cases, penicillin and isoniazid, is that in contrast to normally growing cells in the absence of drug in which the synthesis of cell wall um, is uh, coordinated very carefully with biomass growth, in the presence of the drug, penicillin or isoniazid, the cells undergo unbalanced growth. The idea being that they continue to grow, and maybe even to divide for a time, but because they're unable to synthesize a proper cell wall, the wall gets weaker and weaker as the cells grow, and eventually they lyse, and that's what causes their death. Okay? So this, is, this model of unbalanced growth, I think it's fair to say, is how everyone currently thinks that wall-targeting drugs kill uh, bacteria. But go back to the, the movie that I just showed you. I told you to hold on to the fact that as soon as we added the drug, the cell stopped growing. So it's very clear, at least in the case of isoniazid, that this model can't be right because the cells aren't growing. They arrest very quickly in response to the drug, and many hours later, they die in lice. So at least in the simple form, the unbalanced growth model cannot be correct. Um, now, these experiments allowed us to address this other issue that uh, Bigger raised as well, the issue of persisters. Might the persisters be a subpopulation of cells that are, for whatever reason, not growing at the time the drug is added? That turns out not to be true either, at least not of mycobacteria with respect to any of the TB drugs that we've looked at. So this is uh, data from one experiment, but we've done this experiment countless times now, and it's highly reproducible, where we looked at the bacteria that survived, the persisters, during a prolonged exposure to isoniazid, and we looked at those that died, and then we traced all the way back through their history, and we measured the growth rate of those cells, the instantaneous growth rate at the time that the drug was added. And what we find is that, in contrast to Bigger's hypothesis, there's absolutely no difference in the growth rate between cells that died subsequently and those that survived. So that idea about how persisters come about is, is also uh, incorrect. Now we considered um, a sort of modified version, if you like, of the unbalanced growth model, which has been around for more than half a century in the case of isoniazid. Specifically, we hypothesized that maybe, even though the cells are not undergoing a lot of net biomass uh, increase, they might be sitting there churning over their cell wall, remodeling the cell wall so that over time, effectively, the cell wall might become more and more deficient, indicated by the thickness of the line here, uh, leading to death and lysis. So we tested that idea directly doing pulse chase experiments in which, in which we uh, pre-labeled the mycolic acids of the bacteria, which on a thin layer of chromatography plate migrate here or here. It's different plates, hence the different migration pattern. 
And we then uh, did a chase in the absence or in the presence of eyes and eyes. So if you do a, a long chase for 0, 3, 6, 9, or 20 hours of these pre-labeled cells in the absence of eyes and eyes, did you see over time dilution of the signal in mycolic acids just due to growth and dilution okay, of, the, of the signal due to biomass increase. If you do the chase in the presence of eyes and eyes, what you find is that there's no diminution of the signal over time, even out to 20 hours, even though by this time, uh, nine hours, something like 99% of the cells have already died. So the wall is apparently not turning over. There's no loss of mycolic acids, and so this cannot explain the killing action of this drug, which leaves us with the question, how does isoniazid actually kill cells? We um, hypothesize that it may be due to accumulation of toxic intermediates of the mycolic acid biosynthetic pathway after inhibition of a specific step in that pathway. We have no direct proof for that, but it is a testable hypothesis. Now we've done similar experiments in, in TB. Uh, this is a movie of TB, but I think I'm going to, to skip it because uh, it's a long movie and just tell you that it looks much the same as what we showed already in Smegmatis with one important difference, which is that we find, I can just have it running in the meantime, what we find is that uh, if we treat MTB for a very long time, for you know, anywhere from two weeks to eight weeks with isoniazid, um, at, after this very long period, we find that most of the cells have died in lice, but there's always a substantial fraction on the order of about 1% or so that fail to undergo lysis and which continue to express GFP at a very high level. And I'm not going to go to the end of the movie. This is the last frame of that movie, okay? So there are a lot of cells that still express GFP, and these cells are um, impermeable to the dye propidium iodide, which specifically penetrates and stains cells that have a compromised cell wall barrier. So they're expressing GFP, they're just as bright as they were at the outset of drug therapy, even if it's gone on for as long as eight weeks, okay? There's no, di no diminution of signal. They are impenetrable to propidium iodide, and so they look like they might actually be alive, but when we withdraw the drug, they don't grow. As a last test of whether these cells are actually metabolically active or not, we engineered a form of GFP which was driven from a TET-inducible promoter. And after six weeks of exposure to isoniazid, when uh, we had rendered cells incapable of regrowing after washout of the drug, we showed that uh, you can now add the inducer and the cells induce with exactly the same kinetics as if they had never seen the drug. So they're not growing, they're not dividing, but biochemically, they're still extremely active and able to respond to an inducing signal to turn on de novo transcription and translation. So in a lot of ways, these cells look like they're alive, and, and yet they don't grow. So um, technically, at least, they seem to be uh, in, in a latent state. And this is a very charged term in TB, and there's a lot of uh, silly discussion and, and arguments about what this term means in the, in the context of TB. So I just want to hasten to add that I'm just using the dictionary definition of TB, which is dormant or undeveloped, but able to develop normally under suitable conditions. Okay, so we hypothesize that these cells might still be alive and might be able to reactivate their growth if we could find the right conditions to, to give them just the right tickle. Again, uh, that's purely hypothetical, but we hope it's a testable hypothesis. So that's just a close up, I'll skip that. Um, okay, so we would, uh, we would, um, like to be able to study this persistence phenomenon in TB, but again, it's uh, studying cells that are not in a growing state. We'd also like to be able to follow up on odd observations we make, like the one shown here, where we, on very rare occasions, we see cells that respond very abnormally uh, to drugs like isoniazid. So here's a population of cells that are being treated with INH, but keep your eye on this cell here because it's going to be doing something very strange. In the continued presence of the drug, this cell suddenly resumes growth at the same rate as if the drug's not there, and it grows in this branching form, but it's clearly not resistant because it just died and lysed. And it died all at once, which shows that the cell was not septating properly. So, uh, at least I think that's what it means. That's the most likely explanation. So we occasionally see bizarre individuals like this that respond very differently to the drug, and we think that if we could study individuals like this in, in more detail, um, that this might help us to better understand uh, how isoniazid arrests the growth of cells. Perhaps it's actually an indirect effect of the drug rather than a direct effect. So it, maybe it's a, something more akin to a checkpoint control rather than a direct inhibition of growth. Um, we'd also like to be able to study this strange phenomenon that I described in M. tuberculosis. And we'd like to be able to take both genetic approaches to this and biochemical approaches to this. But again, we're confronting this problem 
of looking at rare subpopulations of cells and looking at a phenomenon that, for the moment at least, we can only score microscopically. So we'd like to carry out uh, genetic screens to identify mutants that respond abnormally, like this, or perhaps by showing enhanced persistence or decreased persistence in response to drug. But our only screening tool here is automated time-lapse microscopy. And so that's what we're doing. We're, we're carrying out uh, screens uh, using drug-treated cells as, as our target, uh, using automated time-lapse microscopy in conjunction with microfluidics. So this is a, a device that we use a lot, a very different device than the one I showed you before. It's quite small. That's an American penny there for a comparison. And uh, this, this is a device with rows and rows of um, flow channels that are connected to chambers. It looks like this on blow-ups. So if you take that little region there and you blow it up under the microscope, here's how it looks. These are flow channels through which we pump medium. These are the microwell chambers into which we can see the mutants. So we take uh, libraries of mutants that have been generated just by random transposon mutagenesis, and we seed the mutants one by one in these wells using microarray robots. Okay? And um, the bacteria that are seeded into these chambers are fed by fluid flow through these channels and by diffusion uh, in, in this direction, and their wastes are carried away in the same way. So this is a great example of how you can achieve using microfluidics uh, tasks that are not achievable at macro scale. And it has to do with the scaling of fluid dynamics, which is quite dramatic, uh, particularly at these scales. Uh, this scaling is captured by a dimensionless term called the Reynolds number, which is basically just a ratio of in the relative um, importance of inertial forces and of viscous forces. If you simplify the equation, you find that you end up with velocity terms and length terms in the numerator. And uh, length, of course, by definition, scales with size. Velocity typically does as well. Okay? E. coli swims fast for its size, but it swims very slowly in absolute terms compared to us. And what this means is that the Reynolds number, and therefore the contribution of inertial forces, scales down um, very rapidly as, as you change the scale of devices like this, such that at, uh, at small scales here, just to give you an idea, that channel there is about 25 microns in diameter. This chamber is about 100 microns in diameter, so it's quite small. Um, at these scales, inertial forces basically don't exist. Viscous forces rule fluid dynamics. All fluid dynamics uh, uh, are controlled by viscous forces. And what this means is that flow is purely laminar. There's no turbulent mixing, which means that if we put cells into one of these chambers and we flow medium past here, all the mixing is by diffusion, which happens very fast at these scales. Again, diffusion is not a significant contributor to mixing at our scale, but it's all important at micro scale. Now, at macro scale, the, the bacteria would simply wash out. But because flow is purely laminar, the streamlines, in fact, don't enter here at all. They just flow on by, and so the bacteria sit tight and grow quite happily. So this is an example, again, of how you can do something with a microfluidic device that would be impossible to do at macro scale. So using this type of device, um, we are screening for mutants that show altered responses to isoniazid, specifically is the focus of our studies currently. And um, so far, it's working quite well. We see some cells that behave very strangely in the presence of the drug. But most importantly, we find mutants, which read true on retesting, that show altered persistence in response to this drug isoniazid. So here in black is the behavior of wild-type bacteria. This is a batch culture experiment now log CFU on the y-axis, hours after drug addition on the x-axis. So again, we see this typical biphasic killing with isoniazid. We've identified mutants that show enhanced persistence in the presence of the drug. Turns out that this is because they replicate more rapidly in the presence of the drug. But the, the probability per cell of surviving is exactly the same. It's just that more cells are being generated. Conversely, we find mutants like this one that are profoundly defective for persistence in the presence of the drug. That's a log scale, so the, the frequency of persisters here at this time point is 10,000-fold lower than uh, the mutant shown here. This particular mutant, uh, which is interesting, also taught us something uh, unexpected about the action of isoniazid on cells. Hitherto, we had thought that you add isoniazid, it does something to the cell that leads to lysis, and that's what death is all about, because you see that the cells always lyse eventually. What we found using this mutant is that death and lysis are, in fact, dissociable. <clears throat> so in this experiment, I'm going to show you a co-culture of wild-type bacteria and mutant bacteria that have been differentially tagged with either GFP, so they're green in the case of wild-type, or red fluorescent protein, so they're red in the case of this, uh, this F4 mutant, as we call it. 
This is the mutant, you'll recall from the previous slide, that uh, is incapable of regrowing after removal of the drug. It's a little bit dim, I hope you can see. So they're growing, now we add drug. What you can see is that uh, both the wild type and the mutant arrest and begin to lyse, but in fact the mutant lyses a lot less than the wild type. These cells are all dead. We've never seen this mutant regrow after drug washout. So all the cells are dead, but on a per cell basis, they actually lyse less, not more, than the wild type bacteria do. So this tells us that lysis is some kind of terminal event, if you like, in the action of this drug, but it's not actually how we think, how the drug kills the bacteria. So um, again, and, and after drug washout, the wild type survivor grows back, the mutants don't. So um, that leaves us again with a conundrum of exactly how does this drug actually kill cells? It's not by unbalanced growth. It's not by blocking mycolic or depleting mycolic acids per se, and it's not by triggering lysis. Something else is going on. We don't know what the answer is. Uh, but that's an area that we're continuing to work on. Now, one of the interesting things that we noticed in the screen is that insertions that led to, to even mild perturbations of expression of the bacterial catalase had a profound impact on the frequency of persistence to isoniazid. And this was interesting because, in fact, isoniazid is a prodrug. After it gets into the cell, it has to be modified by the bacterial catalase, CAT-G, by covalent uh, addition of NAD. And it's this adduct, INH-NAD, that is actually the killer that uh, blocks mycolic acid biosynthesis and does whatever else uh, this drug does in the cells. So to, to look at the relationship between catalase levels and uh, killing, or persister frequency, and killing uh, by isoniazid, we constructed a, a knock-in strain in which the catalase gene in the chromosome of the bacteria was surgically replaced with a CAT-G red fluorescent protein fusion protein, which behaves, you'll have to take my word for it, I won't show you the controls exactly like um, a wild type catalase, so it's fully active. And uh, this was done under conditions where we could titrate the expression of this fusion protein by, um, by using uh, uh, and uh, anhydrotetracycline, ATC. So it's a TET-inducible promoter driving expression of this thing. And what we find uh, compared to the wild type, so again, this is percent survival against hours after drug addition, is that compared to wild type bacteria, which show this nice biphasic kill curve that you've seen before, uh, if we don't induce the promoter at all, we still get some killing, so it is a bit leaky. But if we now crank up uh, in tenfold steps, the dose of the inducer that we give them, we find a very nice scale, corresponding scaling downward of the persister frequency. So as you increase the expression of catalase, you decrease the persister frequency uh, for isoniazid, suggesting the possibility that in these cells, catalase may actually be limiting for activation of this drug and may be effectively limiting its clinical usefulness. So we hypothesized that uh, in fact at the single cell level, there might be a relationship between the expression of catalase, so this would be a cell that's expressing very little, this would be a cell that's expressing a lot, and the likelihood of that cell being a persister or dying. So we hypothesize that the cells that underexpress catalase might in fact be the persisters. And to test that directly at the single cell level, uh, we use the strain that I mentioned already in which the um, CAT-G is fused to the red fluorescent protein. In this case, it's knocked in at the chromosomal locus so that it's expressed from its own transcription and translation signals, okay? So the idea that we were testing here is that cells that underexpress catalase may be persisters. Those that over express at higher levels may die. Um, what we found was something much more bizarre and I think interesting, which is that the expression of this protein follows a pul at the single cell level follows a very pulsatile pattern. And so it's actually difficult to identify correlations, but, but here's how it looks. So I'm going to skip the first part of the slide and go right to the part where the cells are being, just uh, starting to be treated with isoniazid. And what you can see if you look at individual cells is that the, the microcolony flashes like a Christmas tree. So at any given time, over time, the population average value for catalase expression is the same. We've measured that. But in fact, what this represents is a small subpopulation of cells that are expressing catalase at any given time, and the rest of, uh, the, rest of the cells are not expressing. So it's a, it's a very unusual expression pattern. We've, we've never seen it before. We don't know what drives it. The pulses of catalase expression are very short. They're a very small fraction of the cell cycle time. So there must be active degradation of the fusion protein going on here. 
I can tell you that it's not due to the promoter. It's something to do with the protein, the CAT-G protein itself. It's not RFP. RFP by itself, driven even from the catalase promoter, does not follow this pattern. So there's something about the, the protein that confers this, this, uh, this pattern of expression that's, that's quite striking. And obviously, we'd like to understand what are the mechanisms that control that. And again, we can take this strain now and go back to the microfluidic device that I showed you before for screening, this multi-well device that I showed you for screening to try to identify mutants that alter this expression pattern. So in the last two minutes or so, I want to tell you about another approach that we're taking to try to bring the tools of biochemistry to bear on the persister problem in TB and M. smegmatis. Again, the problem is that the population you want to study comprises a very small fraction of the total population. So um, population averaged measurements on things like proteomics, transcriptomics, et cetera, are basically useless in this context because you're measuring the cells that die, not the cells that survive. If we had an effective way to purify the persister cells away from the non-persister cells, then we could start to apply a lot of these techniques to these cells to try to learn more about them. To do this, uh, we've cobbled together a, um, a sort of hybrid microfluidic microelectromechanical system. This is what it looks like grossly. Here's the working part of the device right here that uses dielectrophoresis as a means of separating live cells from damaged or dead cells. So cells, of course, are dielectric particles, which means that if you put them into an asymmetric alternating current electric field, you can generate a dipole moment on those cells. Now, depending on the polarizability of that particle compared to the polarizability of the surrounding medium, particles will either display positive dielectrophoresis, meaning that they're attracted to regions of high field strength, or negative dielectrophoresis, meaning that they are attracted to regions of lowest field strength. Now, because the live cells and the dead cells or the damaged cells have very different membrane properties, their dielectric properties are also very different, which means that with a judicious uh, selection of conditions, particularly uh, conductivity and permittivity of the, of the media that we use for separation, we can actually uh, find conditions in which live cells display positive DEP and dead, dead cells display negative DEP or vice versa, in fact. Now, um, if we, so if we put a population, a mixed population of cells into a device like this, we can cleanly separate the cells that are live and intact and healthy from those that are damaged or dead. Now, if we combine that with microfluidic flow, we have a relatively high throughput system in which as we flow the mixed cell population through here, the um, live cells and the damaged cells are steered to different streamlines. And again, at this scale, so this is a 20 uh, micron diameter channel. Again, it's very low Reynolds number. The, there's no turbulent mixing at all. So once the cells are steered to these different streamlines, they stay there. They mix only by diffusion, but cells on these time scales uh, don't, don't diffusively mix at all, which means that after running them through, so this is actually how the device looks uh, down a microscope, after running them through this gauntlet, if you like, of arrayed microelectrodes, when they come out at uh, the other end, the live cells and the dead cells have steered to different streamlines, which means we can collect them separately downstream for processing. This works brilliantly for yeast. Yeah, this is the last slide. This works brilliantly for yeast. You can get complete separation of live and damaged cell populations with no cross-contamination. Uh, between them, but yeast are big compared to bacteria. So far, it doesn't work quite as well um, for bacteria, but um, uh, we're quite hopeful that we can uh, clean it up and scale it up so that we can actually use this approach to purify um, these persister populations away from the non-persister populations so that we can biochemically characterize them. That's a movie of uh, actual separation. I'm not going to show it, and it's the end of my talk. I just want to mention briefly the people who actually did the work. A lot of the work was done by two very talented postdocs, Niraj Dar and Yuichi Wakamoto in the lab. Yuichi recently left the lab to start his own lab at University of Tokyo, where he'll continue working on aspects of this work. Uh, Michael Unser, uh, over in the School of Bioengineering, has been uh, enormously helpful in uh, trying in our efforts to develop uh, automated algorithms for image segmentation and analysis. A single experiment uh, of this type gives you many tens of thousands of images that all have to be processed and quantified and so on. It's a huge amount of work if you have to do it all by hand. So uh, this is Michael's specialty, and, and he's been enormously helpful. Um, this work is an ongoing collaboration with a friend and colleague uh, back at Rockefeller, uh, Stan Leibler, uh, who's uh, very interested in modeling aspects of the persister phenomenon. He's a physicist by training. Uh, but the real hero of the story is a PhD student in my lab, Meltem.
um, who's done all of the, the, uh, fabric, the design, fabrication, and, uh, and application of the microfluidic and microelectromechanical systems I've shown you. Meltem's uh, background is engineering, um, so she, her master's degree was in a field called mechatronics. Um, she came to the lab to, to learn some biology, and uh, she's a very brave soul because not only did she step into a completely new world for her, but she's oppressed not just by one, but by three mentors. So she's co-mentored by Philippe Reynaud, a colleague over in the School of Engineering who also heads the Center of Micro Nanotechnology. So he's an expert in microelectromechanical systems and also by Sebastian Merkel, um, who is an expert in microfluidics in the School of Engineering, and who incidentally um, did his PhD with Steve Quake, uh, one of your, your neighbors here. So I'll close there, and I'm happy to take any questions. I just want to make sure I understood with the um, MTB treated for eight weeks in your device with INH. You have several criteria that the cells are metabolically active and alive, yet they never regrow? They don't, they don't regrow under conditions that, that we've been able to establish. Have you so tried if we simply wash away the drug and let them sit yeah. there for weeks, they don't regrow. Have you tried adding anything that might contain RPF? Um, so there are a number of things we could try, you know, spent culture medium, resuscitation promoting factors, and, and, and so on. And at the moment, um, we haven't done any of those experiments. So there are certainly some things we could try. So the catalase pulsing, um, it seems like it would have to be some kind of post-translational modification. Well, it must be so, getting degraded. Well, we don't know what's getting so degraded. It's, yeah. yeah, so it's got to be being degraded, yeah. but what changes that rapidly and marks it? So do you know if uh, kinases or phosphatases are involved in, in mediating these processes? No idea at all. We don't have any idea. But there must be active degradation going on because the, the length of that window from basically at background levels of expression to full on and full off again is only on the order of 35, 40 minutes, which is a small fraction, right, even of, so this is clearly not dilution because of growth and so on. It's not shutting off expression and, and diluting. Can't account for it. It's got to be active degradation. But we have no idea, Tom, what's going on. That's, but we can apply genetics, we hope, to that. I don't, I don't really believe in genetics, but um, does, does, um, it's been speculated for a long time that isoniazid has many targets in addition to INHA um, based on the very reactive uh, INH NAD addict. Could it be that these are contributing to, the, to death, death um, in yeah. a way, even though they're not the primary target? Sure, sure, they could be. It could be death by a thousand cuts, really, that's going on. I mean, I guess the argument against that is that, uh, relatively speaking at least, mutations, certain mutations that upregulate, for example, INHA give you some resistance. But it could be that there's sort of a scaling, if you like, of sensitivity of different processes. And it could be that inhibition of the different processes is even additive in terms of their contribution to death. It's a probabilistic thing, and if you've hit enough targets, then that adds up to death. We, we don't know. But. <laughs> But I, th but I think, you know, that it's, to my mind, it's up in the air at this, at this point. But I think the simple model that, that uh, I think we've all believed, which is unbalanced growth, is I think that that's dead. I don't think that's true. Have you, have you started to look at the phenotypes that come out of the microscopy, just simple things in terms of morphology, in terms of predicting which cells will end up being the persisters out of the isogenic populations? So we've, it's a great question, you know, so what... <laughs> It's a very negative talk, right? We, we, we say this isn't true and that's not true and this isn't true, but we don't know what is true. Um, so, so far, aside from the catalase lead, which has been a difficult one to follow because of this bizarre pattern of expression, so finding correlations in time and branching time series with this sort of phenomenon is statistically a nightmare. So um, aside from that, that lead, uh, no, not really. But what I can tell you is that the behavior of siblings is highly correlated. So as you saw, there's some, at least for smegmatis, there's some division that goes on at later stages of exposure. So being the sister of a persister makes you more likely to be a persister yourself with a p-value of about 10 to the minus 40. So I think that's probably true. Um, but what, what it is that's similar about those two cells such that they're you know, more likely to survive, we, we still don't understand. So we, haven't, we, we really haven't answered any questions, have we? We've just raised a lot of questions. <laughs> I call that job security. <laughs>
So I, I guess your, your data suggests that a, a pool of bacteria treated with antibiotics, uh, the bulk of those are going to be these non-heritable persisters with non-heritable survival. But I assume that there are some that, that do have a heritable mutation. Sure. And so I'm wondering sure. if you could estimate how many, you know, do you have a sense of the numbers? Sure. So for the reason you don't see them in these experiments is because the frequency is so low. So it's about 10, for INH, it's what, Eric, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7 in that neighborhood. So, you know, we're looking at, in individual experiments, even looking at, you know, a few hundred XY points. Um, so the movies I showed you are just revisiting one point, right? Um, you know, we're, we're talking thousands of cells, not millions of cells. So we, we never actually see resistant mutants of that sort. Now, if you take a resistant mutant, we've done the drill just to make sure everything's kosher. If you take a resistant mutant and you put it in the device and you, and you give the drug, it just grows in the presence of the drug. So there's, there's nothing funky about that. It's just, it's just numbers.